touched it. And it don't touch the maker's own. It's like, it's, it's right where Mark wants it. So. Okay, am I good, Mark? Oh, it seems like it, yeah, okay. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming on such a, a gorgeous day here. I thought at first we were going to have rain, and I thought, oh, good, no one will have any other excuses not to come. So, oh, well, so much for that. So uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, and uh, just so you know, again, as we've done in the past with our general meetings, uh, it is being uh, recorded and streamed live, for, so for those people who aren't able to come, they can be watching it at home if they, if they so choose, although this is the place you want to be. So, um, first I would like to start out by once again uh, thanking the Teleco Village Community Church for being so generous with this lovely, lovely church and allowing us to come in. And with that, then, I will turn it over to uh, Reverend Devin Phillips, who will do our invocation. Thank you, Sue. Uh, I'm glad to have you all here hosted at our church today. Uh, let us go before the Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, you bless us with uh, so much. You bless us with our health, our careers, our families, our homes, our passions, our abilities, God. Uh, they're all blessings from you. And so uh, it's my prayer that we would not take those blessings for granted, that we wouldn't take for granted the beauty that surrounds us here in this community, the beauty in our lives, the beauty in our homes. For God, we know that you still have a purpose for us here today, and so we pray that you would grant us wisdom to reveal that purpose to us. We pray for wisdom and discernment for our leaders. Father, that you would guide us all through planning, through visioning, as we discern to seek the betterment of all who live among us, God, that we could heed your words to seek the welfare and the betterment of our community and our country, that it may go well for us. We ask all of this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Okay, so moving along here. Um, so this is a slide that you're all probably very familiar with, that we've been just marching through the year here on this busy, busy uh, political season. So um, as you know, the May 1st primaries already took place for Loudoun and Monroe, in Monroe County, and now we are aiming at the Loudoun and Monroe County general elections for August 2nd, and the state and federal primaries on August 2nd. And of course, finishing up the year November 6th with the state and federal general elections. The HOA meetings then are working sort of in tandem with that so that we can be providing the information that you need to make good choices. So um, moving forward, of course, we're here today and we're focused on the Tennessee state primary. In June, we'll be back again and focusing on the federal offices for those that are representing Loudoun County. And then on July 9th, we'll do the same thing in Monroe County at Kahiti. So, and you've seen this slide before as well. So, so why now? Why, why are we doing these in the middle of, at the beginning in the primary season? And the reason is, is there's a lot of primary, um, a lot of offices where there's only one uh, party that's running. So what you really want to know is who are all of the candidates at this point in time so that you can be making the choice that's right for you in the primary. And why vote? Again, I'll remind you, we're 8,300 strong here in the village, and it's important that our vote be heard. Uh, we're one of the largest voting blocks in Loudoun County, and even in Monroe County, it's important that we, that we get that vote out. In Loudoun County, we represent 24% of the, of the tax base, and so it's important that your voice be there. So what I would also encourage for those of you who might be new to the village, um, make sure you've registered to vote so that you can vote in the next primary and certainly in the general election. So, 
Okay, and once we get done with uh, talking, talking and, and getting to know our candidates for office, we'll learn a little bit about the Teleco Village Business Alliance from Joe Bogardis, and then Dennis Danzig will come up and, and give us the lowdown on what's going on with the 444 repay. So again, just here, here's what the agenda is. We'll introduce the candidates uh, for Tennessee Senator for the 5th and 9th, 9th Districts, also the Tennessee Representative for 21st District, and then after we do that, the candidates will come up and do a wrap-up after they have introduced themselves, answered a few of the questions that you all helped us come up with, uh, they'll have a chance to come back and, and talk with us again. Um, and we've had a little bit of a change in our agenda. Julia Hurley will be coming up actually after, after Lowell talks because she's got another, another obligation. So she will come up and talk about all of the offices that you'll represented here tonight. So she'll be able to give you more information on what all of those offices are. Um, once we get done with our political forum, then again we will bring Joe Bogardis up and he will tell us about the Teleco Village Business Alliance and Shop Teleco. And then we will finish up with Dennis Stanzik, who will again give us an update on what you all are seeing started already. At the, at the north end of the village, and so this will give you a, a, a warm and comfy about what's going to be going on. So, uh, and we will try to eke out a little bit of time if you have questions for Dennis. So, with that, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is um, do a quick introduction of the two candidates that were not able to join us today. So first, Randy McNally, uh, who is uh, running for the State Senate 5th District. Uh, he is the Republican Senate Speaker, served on the Senate Finance, Ways and Means Committee for 26 years, chairman for a decade, overseeing the passage of a balanced budget, recognized across the state as a finance and budget expert, chairman, Senate Education Committee, 102nd and 103rd General Assemblies. He has a Bachelor of Science from Memphis State University in 1967 and graduated from UT College of Pharmacy in 1969. His wife Janet, uh, he has wife, his wife's name is Janice and they have two adult daughters and three grandchildren. How will he work and represent Teleco Village if elected? Continue to fight for fiscal conscience keeping Tennessee's budget in balance and its credit AAA rated, and continue to represent Loudoun, Anderson, and Knox counties. Okay, then for Tennessee Senate 9th District, Mike Bell lives on a farm in southern McMinn County and has been married 33 years to his wife Lisa, and they have five children. He was elected to the Senate, uh, Tennessee Senate House in 2006 and elected to the Tennessee Senate in 2010. He's the chairman of the Senate Government Operations Committee and serves on both the Senate Energy, Agriculture, Natural Resources, and the Judiciary Committees. He's a small businessman working with his oldest son. And how he'll support Teleco Village is to continue to represent the residents of Monroe, Bradley, McMinn, Meggs, and Polk counties. So now what we'll go ahead and do, which is what you might be familiar with from the last one of these that we did, is we will have the, the, the rest of the candidates come up, they'll, the, you know, their bio slide will be up, and um, they will then choose to address uh, one of the are two of the three questions that, that the community created for us. And so, 
first we'll ha and then we're going to have a again a little bit of a change to the to the agenda here tonight. So Lowell will come up and talk, and then after after Lowell is talk, then we'll have Julia come up and uh, and talk, and then we'll proceed through as as we planned. Um, so again, our our candidates with us here today are. Uh, Tennessee representative candidates for the 21st District, Lowell Russell, Tony Akins, Doyle Arp, and Laura Miller. For Tennessee Senator, 5th District, we have Stuart Starr, and we have for the 9th District, Carol Lansden. So I would like to thank all of you for coming. I know you're super busy, and we really appreciate you coming and talking with us today. The one thing that I wanted to do is just quickly go through the questions that the candidates were given a uh, choice of picking two out of these three. So the questions are, in, from a perspective of priorities, to provide maximum benefit to your constituency, if you're elected, what would your top priority be if you could only accomplish a single objective during your tenure? The second question revolves around legislation with local impact. An amendment was attached to House Bill 447 in the Tennessee General Assembly, which passed just before the session ended. The current law states that a liquor store can only be licensed in an incorporated community, and Teleco Village is not an incorporated community. The amendment allows the POA to operate a liquor store in the village. What is your opinion about this change? And the third question is revolving around keeping Teleco Village involved. In both Loudoun and Monroe counties, Teleco Village contributes significant property tax dollars, new home growth, sales tax, and employment for services, yet we're not eligible for federal or state funding, nor other benefits in part because we are not incorporated. If elected, how would you address this? So, with that, I'll invite Lowell Russell to come up. Well, thank you all for having us here today and showing interest in our election. It's an honor to be here. Uh, before I start, I'd like to see a show of hands of anybody that's ever served in the military. If you just raise your hands. You all deserve a big round of applause. You know, we couldn't have free elections if it wasn't for our military, and I really appreciate your service. After I'm finished speaking today, I have to uh, go to Sequoia High School, where I have the honor of giving out a scholarship in memory of Lance Corporal Frankie Watson that was killed in Afghanistan on September the uh, 24th, 2011. So, as a state representative, I will assure you I'll support our military and our veterans. But to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm Lowell Russell, and uh, I'm here today just to simply ask for your vote and your support. I grew up in Vaughnor, Tennessee, just right over the hill there, and graduated Vaughnor High School, later went on to uh, get a degree in criminal justice, and worked most of my career in public service as a Tennessee State Trooper here in Loudoun and Monroe Counties. Unfortunately, in 2012, my patrol car was hit by a tractor and trailer, and I was unable to turn to work as a Tennessee State Trooper, so I started to begin to look for other ways to serve my community. As far as the three question goes, if I can accomplish one thing as a state representative, I would like to accomplish the task of where grandparents would have more rights that are having to raise their grandkids of drug addicted parents. I think that we got a problem with the opioid epidemic across Tennessee and across this nation, and I think that's a good start. But specifically, what I'd like to accomplish for Teleco Village is I would like to lower your 501c4 taxes. There's a lot of uh, HOAs that uh, has tax exempt 501c4s, and you're not one of them. If you go buy a fire truck, you've got to pay sales tax on it. I think we need to start with that. So that'll sort of answer questions one and three. As far as uh, question two with the liquor store, I really don't agree how it was uh, voted in, but uh, I'm not in the legislature yet. I think that should have went to uh, a people's vote, a referendum, and let the people decide. 
I think that's where we should have started because I've went around and I asked people in Teleco Village how they feel if they're for and against it, and I've got answers for both ways. So I think that should have been a vote done by the people. Uh, I'm a member of First Baptist Church in Madisonville. I'm in the area quite a bit, so I encourage you, if you hadn't seen me yet, maybe shoot me a message on Facebook or look my number up in the phone book and give me a call. I'd be happy to come over and speak with you or speak to any groups. And if you're looking for someone that's not a career politician to represent you, I'm asking for your vote and support. Thank you. Okay, Julia. Hi everyone, my name is Julia Hurley. I am owner of the Julia Hurley Group and head investor at the Keller Williams in Lenore City. Many of you came out to our ribbon cutting and thank you. Uh, before I start explaining all of the wonderful in in intricacies of our Tennessee state uh, political system, I'd like to point out a few of my friends that are here today and I was so pleased to see them come in. My very good friend, your current state representative, Jimmy Matlock is here. He would appreciate your vote for Congress, I'm sure. Jimmy, give a wave. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you. And our mayor, we appreciate you voting for him and sending us back to him, sending him back to us, Mr. Mayor Buddy Bradshaw, Loudoun County Mayor. Thank you. We also very much appreciate Mr. Henry Colin, your county commissioner. He is also on the chamber board with me and it represents you very well there. We have Vice Chair of the Loudoun County Republican Party, Ms. Frankie Shields out there in the back. I saw her come in. Say hello to her if you'd like to get involved. And my personal city council member, because I live in Lenore City City Limits, is city council member Jim Shields is also with us today. Um, I do want to point out Joe Bogardis is here. You all know him. He represents you extremely well on the Visit Loudoun County Board, which also sits on our board monthly for the chamber. So we appreciate you appointing really great representatives to represent you. So I'm Julia Hurley. I have been a former state representative in the Loudoun County and Roan County areas. I am currently the state executive committee woman for the Tennessee Republican Party. I represent Loudoun, Anderson, and Knox counties. I was also in charge of the Tennessee State Party bylaws changes for this year that will affect the next decade of Republican candidates and I just won my primary, so I'm the Republican nominee for district to seat a Loudoun County Commission. So that's a little bit about me. So going through each of these, do we have a, yep, thank you. Um, each of these, and I'll quickly touch on them because there is so much to go through. The governor's seat is one of those where people think that he is the regulator of the state of Tennessee but he is not. He does not actually regulate law. He approves law. The legislators agree to legislate or write. The representatives typically bring the bills the Senate usually co-sponsors. Now the governor does have a governor's agenda. Of course, they all do when they are elected. So they pass that down through more experienced legislators who then turn that into written legislation and try to get that passed. So the, the governor actually will sign or not sign any legislation into law, but he does not actually regulate the law. That's what his boards of appointed committees are for. So the governor appoints several boards across the state of Tennessee who carry out specific things such as TDOT for roads commissioner. He doesn't actually manage the roads, but he manages the chairman of uh, the division of TDOT, if that makes sense. So um, he does that through children's services, corrections, and education. So these people that are on his appointed boards are, are typically the people that you will see come to regional meetings and give explanations on what's really happening in the state of Tennessee. So the governor does set a budget. He runs the state budget, it's, or they, he or she, runs the budget. They come up with a number of things that they would like to accomplish. And in as, accordance with the Senate budget committee, which at previously had been run by Governor Senator McNally, Lieutenant Governor Senator McNally, uh, for quite some years. So they actually carry that through, and then the State House and the State Senate come together, typically by the end of session, um, and reset that budget and come up with ways to make sure that all of your needs are met through the taxpayer dollars, because Tennessee is constitutionally a balanced budget state. 
So that is something that we really appreciate our legislators working on on a regular basis. Um, he is the commander of chief of our state military for our Tennessee Armed National Guard. So we really appreciate taking into consideration anyone who's previously held any experience in that as well. Uh, they're elected every four years and it is limited to two consecutive terms. Senators, this is my favorite. So there are 33 senators. There are, there, there are one senator for every three state house of representatives. So Knoxville, which is a sliver of Knox County, all of Loudoun County and all of Anderson County is Senate District 5. I am the state committee woman for Randy McNally's Senate seat. So there are two, a female and a male, state executive committee members per Senate member. So 33 Senate members. They are typically the ones that carry the larger burden, even as a smaller body of passing legislation. There are 99 State House of Representatives. They all have their own wants and needs for their districts, and they all have their own way about going about getting a bill passed. Speaker Beth Harwell passed a moratorium, I guess you could say, or a limit on the amount of bills one state legislator could bring forward. Senate members have to co-sponsor the bill to get anything approved and to the governor's desk. So without that Senate member co-sponsoring your piece of legislation and choosing your limited legislation, you basically have a dead bill. So senators do have a very difficult time juggling, let's just say they have three representatives they are working with, which one of those representatives' bills are the most important to co-sponsor. So their, their job's a little harder. Um, voting and upholding or overriding gubernatorial votes, obviously. Uh, raising and lowering taxes, we all have that responsibility. They all have that responsibility. Legislators as a whole have that responsibility. And again, that is a law that the governor will or will not pass, but it is also part of the budget committee. Um, and elected to four-year terms, there are no term limits in Tennessee on legislative seats. House of Representatives. This one is, this is a very large body of people. These are typically the people that you see on a regular basis in your districts because they have smaller districts. So some Senate seats have nine counties. State House of Representatives seats typically have one whole county, or in the case of Knox County, one small section of zip codes that they represent. Loudoun and Monroe County share because they don't have enough people yet to stand on their own, but eventually I'm sure we will if we keep growing. So they introduce and pass bills and legislation. They do that through their subcommittees, through their committees, and then it makes it to the House floor. Once it passes the State House floor, it's moved on to the Senate floor after that. So the State House of Representatives are typically your first stop for all pieces of legislation or changes that can legally and lawfully be made in the state of Tennessee through their subcommittees. Um, let's see what else did I put on these notes. Elected for two-year terms and no term limits. Um, I will say this is an extremely important year for each of you to determine who you will be voting for in this year's primaries or elections, period. This year is a redistricting year. That means that 99 State House of Representatives are redrawing the district lines where the next 10 years will go. It is based mostly on residential numbers. And because Memphis has lost so many people, Nashville has grown so many people, East Tennessee is gaining people from those two places coming here. That experience at all in any elected capacity is going to be extremely important this year. So please remember that it is a redistricting year. The lines for this state will be redrawn this year. Please weigh that heavily in your minds in the voting booth when you go to vote. Executive committee man and woman. So every party has their own, or each party has their own. The Tennessee Republican Party being in the super, super, super majority, we set our rules a little differently. Um, our state party runs separate from the state caucus. So the state caucus are elected officials. They're already elected officials, right? So the state party is in charge of candidates. We get new candidates elected. 
and that's what our, our job really is. We vet candidates through the contest and credentials committees of each of the 88 out of 95 county parties that we are in charge of, and we fund that through our local party partnerships. So this year, we had a massive rules change at the state party level that we added to what we considered a bona fide Republican status. So maybe or maybe not, you have heard or read the paper that several candidates have been removed from ballots and removed from being able to run as elected officials or run to become an elected official this year. And that rules change is why. So the state parties set the rules and guidelines for candidates and for each local party. So the state party has a different set of uh, bylaws that they have to go by. This year we changed on the Republican Party side that you must have voted three out of four consecutive statewide primaries and one of two things. You must have donated to or volunteered to the satisfaction of your local party chairman, period. The only two exemptions were military status and age, because obviously if you're running for office at 21, you may not have been able to vote in three consecutive statewide elections. So we have started to shore up, is a good word for it, our super, super, super majority. Our rules before were extremely lax. It was two of four of the last whatever primaries. And as we continue to grow as the ruling party for now in Tennessee, we want to make sure that we are getting the best of the best candidates. So we made that rules change. I have personally traveled to 80 of the 95 counties and uh, <laughs> met with several party chair people and explained this process on many occasions. Um, it, it does get quite heated. It's always very exciting in politics. So um, is there something else that's on that? Nope, okay, so just wanted to shore it up. Uh, please remember it is a redistricting year this year. That is an extremely large responsibility. So one of those things is going to be um, basically where your lines are drawn for each state house and which member would be representing that line. And that would just be my, my most stressful thing. If you need me, if you have any questions or concerns, um, obviously your Republican Party uh, chairwoman or vice chairwoman's back here. You can contact me, uh, Julia Hurley Group at gmail.com, and I'll leave my cell phone with the ladies here if you need, need me or have any questions. Thank you so much for participating in your civil duties. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Okay, with that, then we'll go back to uh, where we started, and, and uh, Tony Akins, I'd ask you to come up and, and do your. Uh, I've got my own microphone. You have your own microphone. Wow. Does it work? I just... It does work. All right. Well, thank you all for being here this afternoon, and it certainly is an honor here to be with you. My name is Tony Akins. I'm currently serving as the mayor of Lenore City and have been in that capacity since 2010. We've got a lot of things going on in Lenore City, something I'm very proud of. It, and uh, I was a, uh, I'm retired out of law enforcement. I was the chief deputy for 26 years as the number two guy, for Tim Goddard. Just retired in 2016. Before, I was a, a police officer in Lenore City, came up through the ranks and uh, was chief of police in Lenore City as well. So uh, I've have, I have a uh, career in law enforcement, you may say. The question one on the, uh, on the questionnaire, you know, in Lenore City, I promised city council that I would be a team player. And I've been able to do that and accomplish that. We've, we've had uh, many things that's gone on in Lenore City since 2010. One, if you uh, don't know where the venue is, I would encourage you to attend the venue in Lenore City. It's right across the street, from, the road is right across the street from Shoney's, go up to Highway 70. It's a $7 million project that we built and opened up in, in uh, last year on New Year's Day, or year before last, I guess. The other, the other building is a multi-million dollar building, the Lenore City Utilities. Lenore City Utilities currently 
has 100, uh, it's a $200 million company. It has over 100,000 customers. We take in part of Western Knox County. You may have seen some of that in the paper, how Knox County is, is trying to get in a little tax money from Lenore City, and we've been very successful in, in not letting them do that. Lenore City has a $10.5 million budget, and it, was act, it would uh, devastate us, and Representative Matlock has been instrumental in helping us fight that fight for the, for the last 10 years that he's been in office. And certainly, Representative Matlock, we commend you for that. You know, uh, I talked about being a team player. In city politics, uh, particularly city politics, uh, before I was, on, I, I was elected city council in 2003, we, we had a lot of uh, disagreements with the executive branch, I'm going to call it the mayor's office. Since then, it's not been that way. I'm a team player. I'll be a team player for Telco Village and the HOA, the POA uh, organization. Bruce Johnson and I have met and talked, and, and uh, I understand his issues. I understand your issues, and I will be a team player to, to help solve the issues in Telco Village. Uh, the other, one of the other questions about uh, liquor stores. It's my understanding, and, and when I received the uh, when I received the information about the liquor, the the question that was on the, uh, and I have two minutes. Thank you. When I received the uh, question, I researched it. The liquor store issue in Telco Village, of course, now is left up to the POA. You all help put the POA in place. I would suggest if you don't want it, you voice your concerns. If you do want it, you need to voice that as well. And, and uh, we, live in a, uh, we live in America and majority rules. That's the way it is. But uh, uh, it's gone to, uh, it was passed. And, and uh, it's my understanding, it's on the governor's desk waiting to be signed. Or it will take law in, uh, in 10 days after he, re after he received it. So I would suggest that you voice your concerns to the, or your questions to the POA. But I would ask for your vote uh, on August the 2nd. I believe that Teleco Village will uh, play a uh, very important part in this election. And I would appreciate it uh, very much if, if uh, you would vote for me. I have the experience. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Doyle Arp, and I, let me say it is a pleasure to be here to see this crowd out today when you could be out playing golf or on the water somewhere or talking to your grandkids or what have you. First of all, I'd like to introduce my lovely wife here, Kay, and if you don't believe this is a team effort when you're running for political office, try it without them and see how far you get. Right, Jimmy? Uh, the... Uh, when we first decided that we were going to get in this race, uh, one of the first things I did was talk to the wife and talk to the kids to see if they, if I could commit the time to see what needed to be done for the election and then thereafter if we we're fortunate enough to win. But if you look at the bio, Kay and I have six children, uh, one deceased, six grandchildren with one on the way, be here at the end of June, 1st of July, so we're a thriving family. We have a former business owner, county commissioner, assessor of property, county mayor. Retired in 2010, came back out, uh, got to involved in some different things, and the urge was to get back into politics, and that's where we stand today. I was the first inductee into the uh, Loudoun County Hall of Fame of the Republican Party. I uh, was in an inaugural class of the uh, certified public administrators from the University of Tennessee when the state felt like that representatives of government should have more training and things like that, and I totally agree with that. I'm a product of vocational education, going to school at night and trying to learn the tool and die trade, and was a tool and die 
machine shop owner in Loudoun County for about 15 years during my days before I got into politics. Proud Shriner, see us out on the street this week selling papers. That's what we're all about. I've been selling papers since I was 15 year old. I would like to say that in the three questions that you have up there today, <clears throat> One of my main concerns, and what I started hearing when I was elected county mayor, was about how kids are falling through the cracks if they're not taught to read by the third grade. That is a real concern of mine. And if I had one object that I would press for is to get more peer pressure, coaching, whatever it takes, back down in those pre-K up through the third grade that we can get these children to learn to read because they absolutely get dropped through the cracks as farther we go. We have great things for kids that get out of high school. We've got the Tennessee Promise, we've got the Hope Scholarship, they can go to vocational school, we can, get, we can rock on. But ladies and gentlemen, those kids that can't read are dropping through the cracks. We've got to pull those up and get them started again. So that would be my thing to try to press. Now, if you listen to Julia, one representative out of 99. So you gotta convince 50 to go along with you. Then you've gotta convince 17 senators. So the fight is over on the senatorial side in, in getting anything done. And Jimmy sat our 12 years, he knows that full well. As on the liquor store, I'm going to hit on all three of them. The liquor store bill was passed. I would encourage the POA to get it done right because they are going to be looked at from across the state. And I've heard, and I think you're going to hear some more of them say that it, once you open that up, the other 501c3s are going to be looking at what can be done. So I would encourage the POA to be sure and get it done right. <laughs> on the, uh, and I've got a minute left to go. I, I would just encourage you all to get out and vote. Uh, there's a lot of voter apathy in the, in the country, and there's voter apathy in Loudoun County. So encourage your neighbors to get out and vote. I would appreciate your vote. I'm running against two nice gentlemen. There's not anything wrong with either one of them. I can just tell you this, I don't have another job. I, I'm available 24-7, as my wife would tell you. The phone rings, that's the most important thing that I've got going for me. May God bless you all and have a great evening. Thank you. Laura. First of all, I'd like to just take a brief moment and thank you all for coming out. I'd like to thank, thank the HOA uh, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, forum. I want to acknowledge the hard work of Ellen Fox and Sue, as well as Pastor Phillips for letting us use this beautiful church. Um, I would also like to thank um, uh, Lowell Russell and uh, Tony for their current and past services. Uh, we can't do anything alone without having people who have servant-minded leadership. Um, if I could have accomplished one single thing in my tenure um, in the state would be to expand Medicaid. As y'all can see uh, from my bio, I'm a respiratory therapist. I've worked in healthcare for 21 years and I have a servant's heart and I see people suffer every day from lack of health care. Um, a healthy population leads to a better quality of life for everybody. Tennessee is second in the nation for hospital closures. In a lot of our communities where these hospitals are closing, sometimes that is the closest, emer is closest emergent care in the area. And when we're talking about time to get people to the hospital for things like uh, cardiac arrest, it could mean the difference between life and death. Those hospitals can also be the biggest employer in that area. And less than 30 miles away, we have Star Regional who was affected by one of these hospital closures. 
regardless of whether these hospitals get paid or not, they still have to provi provide the care for these individuals. So they bear the burden of having to support staff and operating budgets, but they're not receiving the reimbursements that they need. For states who have expanded the Medicare, there's been a reduction in infant mortality. There's been an increase in the number of cancer diagnoses due to uh, early detection. There's been an increase in coverage for the treatment of medications to um, uh, treat opioid addiction, which is definitely a problem in our area. Uh, Tony and Lowell can attest to that because they work in law enforcement. Um, in states where Medicaid has been expanded, uh, hospital closures are virtually non-existent, especially in the rural communities where they're needed the most. Um, there's better access to medication and treatment for mental health conditions. Um, and some studies have even shown there's been a reduction in the e ER visits and a, de a decrease in the length of stay, which is one of the most expensive costs for a hospital, uh, is taking care of pa patients who have not been able to take care of their chronic diseases. Uh, to talk about um, the second option is, um, first of all, I'd also like to say we need to bring our federal dollars back into the state. By not expanding Medicaid, we're leaving a lot of money on the table and it's our own hard work, earned money. Um, for the second and third questions, they're really fairly similar in my mind. Uh, they share a common issue. Does Teleco Village want or need uh, an, to be incorporated. As a community, communication and knowledge are key to success. If it has been expressed to the HOA and the POA of Teleco Village that becoming incorporated is in the best interest of the people who live here and everyone has been given access to the same information and the majority is in agreement, then of course I support and help in any way. I know it's important to all of you that uh, your property values are maintained and grow over time. It is also important that you can financially sustain this community without burdening the individuals with fees and costs that make it unaffordable and less marketable to buyers. It is also important to address the fact that Teleco Village is responsible for approximately a quarter of the tax base in Loudoun County and brings so much to the table for both Monroe and Loudoun counties. Unfortunately, I find it troubling that the areas surrounding Teleco Village who could potentially help relieve some of the tax burdens are grossly underserved. Mr. Akins may be better able to speak to this as the Lenore City Mayor, but I would think increasing the prosperity of all the county would better serve Teleco Village. The poverty rate of Lenore City is approximately 26%. The household uh, income is barely half that of Teleco Village and a third of the property values. Um, the poverty rate in Loudoun County uh, with the household removed of Teleco Village is roughly 22%. So we need to work together to lift everybody up, not just Teleco Village. Uh, you all have uh, burned a lot of uh, the tax burden, um, and as a whole, um, we need to address the, the county overall. As your representative, I will do what is ever necessary to provide the working populations in Loudoun County with opportunities that would provide a higher standard of living across the board so that tax burden could be shared rather than rest so heavily on one community. I will work diligently to facilitate communications between both counties and Teleco Village and I promise to be a servant leader. Again, I'm appreciative of everyone who took the time out of their busy lives to come here this evening and listen to my concerns. I need your support and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you, Laura. All right, Stuart, if you would come up. Stuart is a candidate for this uh, Tennessee Senate 5th District. I don't want to be here today. This morning, we buried my mother-in-law, Pat Williams. She was 67 years old. She was a lifelong resident of Lenore City. She died of ovarian cancer. I don't want to be here today, but it's important for me to be here today, not for your votes, 
Your votes are one thing. I am here because of a matter of life and death. But let me tell you a good story first, a nice story, a story with a miracle in it. I have a friend, Audrey. About five years ago, she was diagnosed with MS and ALS. It was a death sentence for her. She had five years to live, they all said. There was nothing further they could do for her. So she went outside the medical system and our legal system and used a product that is illegal in our state, CBD oil based on cannabis. Some of you know cannabis as by its other name, marijuana. This year, this year, Audrey got a different diagnosis. She went back to the doctors. They checked her over, looked for the ALS, looked for multiple sclerosis, and found nothing. She's cured. It is a miracle. Now, miracles are great, and miracles are from the Lord above, but sometimes we have to give them a little help. And we need in this state a medical cannabis program. 29 other states have medical cannabis programs. We had an opportunity in this state to have one, and it was killed. It was killed in our state senate. It was killed by our state senate leader, my opponent, Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally. I didn't want to run for office this time. I ran for Congress, U.S. House of Representatives, District 2. I did better than any Democrat had ever done in the district, at least since 2000, and probably before, because I don't want to go looking back that far. You know, I can sit here and tell you the stats about medical cannabis. I can tell you that the first studies in 1974 showed that cannabis can kill cancer cells. I can tell you that there are between 1,000 and 1,500 new studies every year that show the efficacy of medical cannabis for conditions such as PTSD, epilepsy, cancer, chronic pain, and opioid addictions. There are 26,000 published peer review studies and 140 clinical research studies have been done showing that medical cannabis can provide medical relief for many conditions. And then let's not even talk about the social costs involved with keeping a prohibition on cannabis. Did you know that Tennessee is the fifth largest cultivator of cannabis in the United States? We've, we're going downhill though, and back in the 80s, we were number two. Can you imagine the tax benefit if we could regulate and tax it? We're seeing these benefits already in states like Colorado and California. California's reported over $1 billion in tax revenues from legal recreational cannabis in six months. You know, I'm all, I'm, I know you're all concerned about your taxes, and the biggest tax burden we often face is our own sales tax. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could reduce our sales taxes by one half percent? And it is possible. We can do it. We just have to remove the prohibition on cannabis. 65% of our prison population, 65%. You know, it costs more to send people to jail than Yale. And that's still true in this county. I can send, we can send people to UT for less than it costs us to put in our Loudoun County Jail. And let's not forget the $24 million expansion we've just had to do. How much is that based on cannabis prohibition or people who just need medical cannabis for their own conditions getting into trouble because our laws are antiquated? 29 other states have medical cannabis programs. We don't. Do you know, recent polling shows that 80% of people polled in the state of Tennessee favor a medical cannabis program. 80%. You know, I can be up here all day and I can tell you all the great things and everything, and you can say, you know, that's a good idea. Why don't we let people do, make their own decisions? You know, it's not up to you and me. It's not up to even us as the voters. 80% of us favor this, and yet 
your state senator, our lieutenant governor, Randy McNally, when it came time, after Ed passed through our Republican House, with Republican support by Representative Faison and in the Senate by Representative Dickerson. It got to the Senate and our head of the Senate, the Lieutenant Governor, killed. Thank you. Okay, Carl, if you would come up, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I want to, uh, first of all, thank the Homeowners Association for having this uh, town hall meeting. Secondly, I want to thank you for taking your time to come out and participate in your government. You know, I, this is my first opportunity to run for a government office. And I'm not all that enthused about running for government office, but I would like to do something constructive in a situation that is dominated by dirty money. I respectfully submit to you that your democracy is being bought for pennies on a dollar of a return. We have a horrible situation in this state one in which is extracting and pushing working families to the edge of a cliff on a regular basis. The erosion of wealth from working families is horrible and it is getting worse. I respectfully submit to you that people that I represented for about 50 years have seen an erosion of their economic well-being that is almost unimaginable. I retired in 2003. Didn't ever expect to go back to work. Not in the field of politics. I had participated in politics. I had never been in public office nor did I really have any burning desire to be so. However, I worked with government officials all the way to the President of the United States. I did a lot of lobbying as an organized labor representative. I was the international vice president of the IBEW. And that provided me an opportunity to engage with people in all facets of government, both federal and state. And I've seen an erosion in the integrity of our democracy that is unprecedented, and it's getting worse. The Supreme Court decision in Citizens United enabled extremely wealthy people to put money into politics and to literally corrupt our government. And I am running because I want to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. I don't have the type of wealth. Suffice it to say, unless you're a billionaire or a multimillionaire, I'm one of you. And that's what I want to remain. At, uh, at age of 84, you got a guarantee of term limits with me. So I, I respectfully submit to you that, uh, that my goals are achievable. You had a young man not far from this area in the 1940s named Estes Kefalfer. He challenged a political machine that was just awesome, the E.I. Crump machine out of Memphis. Estes Kefalfer, the man with the coonskin hat, decided to take him on, and frankly, he did a wonderful job, but he pole vaulted into New York and challenged organized crime. He was so successful in challenging the Crump machine, and those weren't false thoughts. He was successful there as well, because he called a spade a spade. 
His integrity was beyond reproach. He didn't have it. He was a, I guess he was a David Crockett or, a, or whatever, but he, he was a great Tennessean. And all of you, as well as myself, have every reason to be very proud of him. <coughs> State government has proven that the compassion has left incumbency. When, they, when that state legislature refused to support the governor's accommodating 280,000 Tennesseans who were uninsured at no cost to the state, I was truly disappointed in state government. I still am. Hospitals throughout this state closed in rural areas. People have died as a result of it. And quite frankly, that is unacceptable, unacceptable in these United States. I spent time in the military. At age 15, I went in the Marine Corps. Got kicked out because I was too young. At 15, they didn't, didn't think that people could be a Marine at 15. And you know, in retrospect, I think that's probably good judgment on their part and terrible on mine. I'm, I'm sorry, am I running over? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, look, uh, I ask you if you're, and there's only a few people in, in here, but you know, I failed and miserably so to point out there's, I had some questions. I need to address those real quickly. Well, maybe you can do that in your wrap-up. Okay, I'll do that. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time and your patience. All right, so speaking of wrap-ups then, um, each of the candidates will have uh, three minutes to come back up and kind of give you their parting thoughts. And we'll start with Laura. It's kind of hard to go first after everybody else went before you and there's really nothing to follow up with other than, uh, Tony you mentioned being a team player and um, that's something that is near and dear to me. Being in health care, uh, it takes a team to do anything. Uh, it's not just the team in the hospital, but it's our first responders, it's our EMS, it's our cops, it's everything takes a team to take care of uh, to take care of a community. Um, as far as being a team player, I've been married to a Republican for 18 years and we've not killed each other yet. So I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty proud of that. Um, but um, a thir certain things I wanna touch on again is the jobs, quality jobs, um, wages that will allow somebody to work closer to home so they can be part of a, a children's lives. I drive over 30 minutes each day. 80% of Monroe County drives uh, over 30 minutes uh, to their jobs. We need, we need those type of good paying, sustainable jobs in this area. Um, and also, I, I just want to address the poverty issue again in, in Monroe County, which I live in, Sweetwater. 26% of our children live in poverty. Um, we need our educational systems to be better. We need our teachers to have more support. Um, we need to update our, our broadband internet because children more and more often are having schoolwork that they have to do at home and they don't have access. And not to mention the adult education, which I'm proud to say that I did do some of my uh, master's work online for people to better themselves and be able to work harder and, and provide more for their family. Uh, I definitely think that's something we need to work for. But um, I'm not a, a scare tactic kind of person. I'm a positive person. And we're, we're Tennessee Vols. We, we were the first to volunteer for a lot of things. And, um, it, and Tennessee's a beautiful state, and I think that's the reason why a lot of you have moved here to this area. We've got good people, hardworking people, kind people. Um, but with a super, super majority in our state, we shouldn't be fighting to be last in the things that are most important. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Doyle. Thank you all for enduring our little speeches here this afternoon. And let me say that in wrapping up, uh, what a privilege it has been to be here this afternoon. This is the second time that I've had the opportunity to speak from this podium here. A good friend of mine, Art Spurrier, passed away and his wife, Iris, asked me if I would come and help memorialize him at his passing. And uh, this place was packed because Art loved everybody and everybody loved Art. But let me get back. <clears throat> I uh, served on the POA Communications Committee out here back several years ago when it was in its infancy and they were trying to get different things done. And in the question three here, I would encourage the Homeowners Association and the POA to look at ways that maybe we could change some laws that are on incorporation. That was a big obstacle back when the POA looked at it years ago, was it just too complicated to get it done. That opens up a lot of revenue for the city of Teleco Village if it became a city. Uh, that, that is a possibility today. Uh, and I would be glad to work with you all in trying to get some of that stuff changed to where it would make it easier if that's what the homeowners and the POA would desire to do. Let me just tell you this, I'm strong on pre-K through three. I've already expounded on that. I'm pro-life, Second Amendment, victim's rights. My family lost a son through murder back in 1992. And when we, f they caught the scandals, and when we went to trial, and, and it's nothing against the officers or what have you, but when you get into the court system, the victims have no rights. If you don't believe it, get broke into like we did on December the 12th by a drug head that broke into our house, clipped us for about $18,000 worth of stuff. We recovered about 2,000 of it, had the insurance minimal on the stuff, we had to go to court five times just to get him bound over to the grand jury. So the victims have no rights whatsoever. I will not be putting signs on right-of-ways. Our towns and communities are too nice for these things to be stuck up out on state right-of-ways and on county right-of-ways. All of my stuff will be <clears throat> in areas that are privately owned. So I just want you all to know that. Come election day, you won't see me with a bunch of poll workers. <clears throat> I can't tell you the number of times that I've ran. I only had poll workers one time, and that was in my, the first time I ran in a countywide race. And I said at that time, if my constituents are smart enough to go to the polls, I don't think I need to be there to tell them how to vote for me. Thank you, and may God bless you all. Tony? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here tonight and taking your time to uh, come and, and uh, let us share our thoughts with you. I just, uh, if you want someone to uh, follow the same guidelines as Jimmy Matlock has followed over the last 10 or 12 years, I'm your guy. I'm conservative, I'm pro-life, I'm for the Second Amendment, obviously. And and uh, I didn't get a chance for me to go to touch on it, but... Uh, I'm, I've, uh, as mayor of Lenore City, I've been working with TVA on the uh, uh, creating some recreational amenities and, and things of that nature at uh, 444 and 321. You may have heard about that. And uh, I have a meeting next month with, with TVA and, and Representative Matlock and some other people to try to implement that program and, and uh, have 500 plus acres turned over to uh, to us to, to be able to, uh, to get more recreational activities and, and, uh, uh, and hopefully that, that will happen in the, in the coming months. Obviously TVA, we all know how TVA is and, and they're a little slow. Four or three minutes goes by fast. But uh, I, I'm, I just touched briefly on a couple of things that Lenore City has done, the, the venue and the Lenore City Utilities. 
We did that without raising utility rates, and we did that without raising taxes. Currently, the, the tax rate in Lenore City is 99 cents per $100 of value. That's uh, almost unheard of, of the things that's going on in, in uh, the city. I promise you that I'll continue to bring those conservative values to Nashville. Give me a cup of coffee and a vanilla wafer and send me there, and I'll prove it to you. Thank you very much for being here. I'm a Democrat. I'm a conservative Democrat, which is the black swan of politics nowadays. I don't understand why I'm considered conservative, but I do believe in what Thomas Jefferson said, the government that governs least governs best. As to your liquor store, that is your decision. I believe in something called home rule, where communities decide their own laws in regards to vice, such as liquor, cannabis, adult stores, it's up to you. It's up to you and your community. Our legislature is ranked among the least effective in the country. Supermajorities get very little done, even though they should be able to get a lot done, you would think, but they can't seem to get anything done in, in, in Nashville. And the head of the state senate, which is the superior house, is my opponent, Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally. If you want change, then you have to use an old country knowledge. If you want to kill a snake, you've got to cut its head off. And that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to say, it's time for change. I am a conservative. I believe in Second Amendment rights. I believe in home rule. And I, my opponent couldn't even come here today. And you know the circumstances in which I'm here. It's that important for me to be here to see you. My opponent hasn't had a, an opponent since 2002. Nobody's run against my opponent in, what is that now, 16 years? Wow. Why would you show up? I, he's got it in the bag. Why nobody ever runs against him? Make a decision. Make a change. Thank you. Carl, thank you. Thank you very much. I apologize uh, for taking too much time. I'll try to cut this short. However, I, I do want to mention Again, your democracy is in jeopardy. I respectfully submit to you and ask you to consider this, regardless of your politics. When you give any political party a majority to the point that they refer to it as supermajority, you have forfeited your democracy. You then have a dictatorship by party. Now, having said that, I respectfully submit to you that you have that today. A debate, the optimum, the optimum democracy would be 45% Republicans, 45% Democrats, and 10% independents who would use good judgment to ascertain what the public wanted. Now, I want to ask you, what does, what does pro-life have to do with these jobs? Everybody's pro-life. I'm pro-life. But that doesn't mean that I disagree with the Republican decision to, uh, uh, to uphold Roe Wade. And I say Republican decision because, in fact, that, that common law was created by appointees from Republican presidents. Seven of those justices cast a vote for it. Five of those seven were appointed by Republicans. So don't think partisan politics determines the continuation of Roe Wade. You know, 
I frankly yield to the women that are confronted with such a horrible situation. And I, I don't take a position on it. I set that one out because I'll never have to, I'll never be confronted with that. And so I'm pro-life though. I think everybody's pro-life. Some people have the misfortune of having to make that decision. And my, I believe my time's running out again. So, so thank you very much and thank you again for coming out. I respectfully ask you to consider, get off of partisan politics, it's killing the country, and dark money is going to do us in. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out, and as I said, I know you've all got many other things, and we, we, we give you our condolences. Um, thanks so much, and we'll be moving on to the rest of our our uh, agenda. Oop. Joe, would you come up and talk to us about Teleco Village Alliance? Thank you uh, for coming out uh, to hear uh, this very important uh, forum today. Uh, we're now going to talk about shopping, which I think is a little bit different than what we've heard uh, so far this afternoon. Um, my name, again, is Joe Bogardis. I am the, a member of the Teleco Village uh, Property Owners Association marketing team, uh, and uh, we have been involved for the past six months in a uh, shop Teleco Village um, uh, uh, project. And uh, I would like to, at this point to take a minute to introduce uh, one of my uh, colleagues and a very good friend, uh, Fred Toucher, stand up. Fred, is, uh, this is Fred's idea. And uh, we, we need to thank Fred for his project management skills, which has kept us on track here. Beth Kaburka, the uh, TVPOA uh, Marketing Communications Director, she's not here uh, today, but uh, we all were involved in soliciting businesses for the Teleco Village Business Alliance, but uh, Beth and her team uh, carried the largest load on that, uh, on that part of the project. So survey after survey of um, Teleco Villagers have indicated that if uh, they uh, were, um, uh, they would shop locally, uh, provided they knew more about what was available here in the community. And um, they also have indicated in these surveys in 2015, 2017, and 2018 that uh, if uh, they, they would like to see certain businesses brought into the community. So the Teleco Village uh, Business Alliance and subsequently Shop, Shop Teleco Village is really the result of these particular surveys. The Business Alliance, the Teleco Village Business Alliance, TVBA, is 79 local businesses that have banded together uh, for, uh, to uh, promote greater uh, resident awareness and uh, to uh, disseminate information about uh, these particular entities in the community. They have provided funding for the Shop Teleco Village initiative. The Shop Teleco Village program is really a communication and promotional program that's designed to change the uh, purchase habits of all of us that live in the community. It's uh, really uh, requiring an unprecedented uh, commu a combination of uh, Teleco Village uh, businesses and all the organizations that serve us here in the village. Uh, all the major organizations and our communications uh, channels have been involved in this particular activity. These are the, these are the organizations that have been providing the, uh, support for this initiative. Um, the uh, Property Owners Association, the HOA, Teleco Life, the New Villagers Organization, um, the uh, TVB Channel 3, the Telegram, the Connection, and Nextdoor Teleco Village. The Teleco Village Business Alliance for the last uh, several weeks uh, has been working very closely with all these different organizations to um, uh, get the uh, Shop Teleco Village program underway. 
What I'm going to show you now is really the heart of that program. And it's a 16-page hard copy uh, directory that has a listing of all 79 businesses. They're broken into 39 categories. And they also, in the, in the directory, there is a, a, line, uh, there is a uh, map that will show the location of all the businesses, our brick and mortar businesses here in the community. Uh, this directory will be delivered to all village households on the week of May uh, 21st and the May, uh, week of uh, May 28th. This is the uh, d uh, directory's um, uh, cover. Um, there is an introductory letter, uh, and a ready reference, an index that will show you where all the different categories are listed. And subsequently, here is what a, a page looks like. The yellow striping on each side of the, uh, uh, the pages there, that is a category indicator, and then the business uh, information is located in the center of the page. Here's another page. There's also uh, a, a map. This is the directory of the map. The map, uh, each one of the main shopping areas in the village, as, and that is not only here in the Loudoun County section of the village, but over in Kahiti, are all color-coded. And in each color-coded section, there is a listing of the businesses that are located in that particular uh, area of the community. Oops, sorry, this way. All right, here is the fold-out map, the, and it looks uh, a lot better close up. <laughs> and as you can see, each one of the color-coded areas, these are the main shopping areas in the community, and this is where you're going to be able to identify what businesses are located where. And here is over in Kahiti, there is also uh, Derby Downs is a major shopping area for our Kahiti, Kahiti, uh, Kahiti residents, and they have a location identification as well. Uh, in, the, in the directory, we also have included frequently called numbers uh, here in the village, uh, and um, uh, we also have a reference to our um, uh, farmer's market. At the very end, we want again to thank all our partners. Here is on the very last page is a um, uh, information on uh, where to contact, who to contact. If you're a business in the community and we're not included in this, you can be included the next time. There's also a reference here if you need additional directories. They're going to be available at the Welcome Center. We also need to thank Southeast Bank, who is our platinum sponsor. Uh, and have contributed significantly to help uh, underwrite all these activities uh, for the Teleco Village Business uh, Alliance. So, beginning in early June, the Teleco Village Business Alliance and Shop Teleco Village will be uh, uh, taking the next step. Uh, over time, articles will be published in the Telegram featuring all the members of the TVBA. Uh, and um, the marketing team will start to target uh, non-competitive businesses and we'll be out soliciting these businesses and hopeful to uh, bring them into the community in response to the surveys that have been con have referenced earlier. In that, we strongly believe that Shop Teleco Village program will prove a win-win. Uh, the uh, current business alliance uh, 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 members will win because there'll be greater awareness of, uh, of their businesses throughout the community. The new businesses that we br bring in will win because they'll be aware, uh, they will have a confidence that these are what the uh, villagers want. And finally, all of us will win because we will have a better understanding of what businesses are available to meet our needs and wants here in Teleco Village. So finally, all I have to say is just shop Teleco Village. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so next up, uh, we'll have a Highway 444 resurfacing update from Dennis Stanzik. Well, hello everyone. 
Uh, thank you for your stamina. It's always uh, hard to be the last speaker, but uh, I'm glad that uh, all of you are staying here because I'm, uh, I'm excited to tell you about the, uh, the Highway 444 resurfacing that's going to take place this summer. Uh, but before I get into the details of that, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on this committee. Uh, the name of the committee is the HOA POA TDOT Liaison Committee, and I'm the chairman of that committee. Back in uh, 2015, it was early 2015, Bill Taylor, who was the HOA president at the time, had a vision for what our highway should look like. He was well aware of the tremendous amount of growth that had taken place in the last 20 years. He also recognized that this area is going to continue to grow. Uh, Loudoun County, I think, is one of the fastest growing counties in the state. In order to accommodate that growth, uh, we need to make changes to the highway. We needed to be able to improve traffic flow and also improve safety. So Bill came to me and asked me if I would lead a committee that would inter interact with the uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation uh, to explore ways that we could make our highway safer and uh, accommodate the extra traffic that was going to be moving through. The committee was chartered and approved by the HOA Board of Directors in early February of uh, 2015. And since that time, we've been meeting with the uh, TDOT representatives uh, about four times per year uh, during that time. And we have uh, uh, come up with some specifications, which I'm going to talk to you about first, or in, in a minute. But first, I wanted to recognize the members of the committee. We have Rick Carlin, who was a former HOA president, Rich Camiso, Jeff Gagley, who is the POA representative on our joint committee, Lou Goidel, who was on our committee up until last year when he moved out of the village, Ken Holland, who is also our POA representative, Dick Sawinski, and of course, Bill Taylor has stayed on the committee uh, throughout this whole time period. So working together with the uh, uh, State Department of Transportation, uh, we have, uh, TDOT has uh, finalized all of the engineering specifications for the work on the uh, highway this summer. Uh, TDOT is now soliciting bids from contractors and expects to award a contract early in June. The contractor must schedule the work sometime between June and the end of October. Uh, as soon as the contractor notifies TDOT of when that work is going to start, then our committee will put out notices and we will give updates throughout the project. Uh, it's estimated that the work will take about two weeks, uh, depending on the weather, of course. Um, we had a choice of, of whether this work could be done during the day or at night, and we chose to have the work done at night which would uh, minimize the amount of uh, inconvenience that we have of uh, uh, lane closures. Um, the work is going to be done from about 7 p.m. at night till 6 a.m. the following day, and the work schedule goes from Sunday through Thursday. There will be lane closures of about a mile to two miles as the work crews uh, move along the highway. Uh, there will be some work on the shoulders during the day, but that's not expected to uh, interfere with uh, movement of traffic. So let me, uh, okay, I forgot, I'm supposed to be advancing these slides and I'm just buzzing right through them. <laughs> By the way, this uh, presentation will be on the uh, HOA website, so uh, um, you, you'll be able to go back and refer to it. So I've already covered this slide and I'll try to remember to push this button. Okay, so uh, on to the second bu uh, button. I'm going to go through these improvements starting at the north end of uh, Highway 11. Uh, by the way, the, the whole segment is 11 miles long, and, and I'll, I'll move through that and tell you about uh, the work that's going to be done along each segment. Um, if we start at the uh, north end at the intersection between 444 and 321, uh, you have an entrance ramp that would take you to Merrillville. Uh, TDOT is going to be adding some additional signs and uh, markers uh, because I'm sure you recognize that sometimes that's a hard turn to, to find. Uh, it's easy to get right past it. Uh, 
Uh, one of the other things that TDOT is going to do is they're going to put a dashed line on the pavement to guide left turns going into that, uh, into that ramp. Moving along south a little bit to the popular Ridge Road, uh, there's going to be a right turn lane that uh, will be added and then across the street at uh, the Coyote Point Drive will be a right turn lane from the, from the northbound lane. Uh, and I'm sure you're all well, well aware that uh, some of the preliminary work uh, for the uh, work on the shoulders is already underway. Um, that, uh, that work is, uh, I'll, I'll address that in a little bit later, but uh, that work is needed to uh, improve the foundation for the asphalt that will uh, create those uh, right turn lanes. The passing zone at the Poplar Springs boat ramp will be eliminated. Uh, that has uh, a dangerous area. Uh, especially with slow-moving boat traffic, you have some limited sights coming out of uh, some of the side roads, and so TDOT has agreed that they will uh, uh, remove that passing zone. A little further south, we are going to be adding two left turn lanes, one in each direction at uh, the Coyote Drive and Coyote Shores Drive. The passing zone at the Coyote Tamatli Bridge is uh, going to be shortened. At Cayuga Drive, uh, there's, there's going to be a northbound right turn lane. There already is a, uh, an asphalt pad there, but they're going to uh, uh, make that an official right turn lane and stripe it uh, so that we can uh, go in there and make, the, make those right turns. Then a little bit further south at Ritchie Road, there's going to be a new left turn lane there. Um, so on, from the northbound lane uh, turning onto Ritchie Road, we'll have a, uh, a left turn At that same intersection, there's going to be a new guardrail along the uh, northbound lane. To uh, uh, there's there's a bit of a drop off down there. If you if you recall, that intersection uh, goes down onto the golf course. Um, we're going to have a a new guardrail there installed. Uh, there will be another left turn lane uh, put in at uh, Amoe Way, which is just a little bit south of Ritchie Road. But before you get to the uh, uh, Clear Creek uh, Bridge. Now, at the Clear Creek Bridge, the southern end of that passing zone will be eliminated. So if you can picture that location, it's, it's there, there's a road that goes into the uh, Popular Springs boat landing. Uh, the passing zone in front of that road is going to be uh, eliminated. And then over the entire length of the highway, there are going to be center line reflectors. Uh, TDOT is going to uh, restripe uh, the uh, existing left turn lanes to increase the capacity, meaning the number of cars that can uh, uh, wait in that center line to, or center lane uh, to make a left turn. The idea there is, is to uh, keep those uh, vehicles that are turning left from uh, stopping traffic uh, on the through lanes. Um, the right turns will also be remarked so that it'll be a broader right turn. So you can make, make those turns at maybe just a little bit higher speed uh, without uh, slowing traffic behind you. Um, there's going to be those dash lines that I mentioned to you before uh, going from the side streets onto the uh, Highway 444 to guide you into left turns. Um, the transitions between the highway and the bridge, which are a bit rough right now are going to be uh, smoothed out and the shoulders of the road uh, along the entire length will be uh, will be continuous uh, which will be uh, something that uh, our bicycle riders in the neighborhood uh, uh, will appreciate. So back to the preliminary work um, they're going to continue moving down the highway uh, and uh, uh, reinforcing the shoulders uh, we'll probably be seeing some work done at uh, the Davis Ferry intersection, uh, making those turns a little bit broader. Same thing at uh, the Maple Hill, which is opposite Sequoia Drive that goes into the Yacht Club. Uh, those shoulders uh, will be uh, uh, made a little bit wider to, uh, so that you don't have to make such a, a sharp turn. But during this preliminary work, they're going to be removing uh, the guardrails. Uh, removing damaged asphalt and then replacing it with some gravel uh, to uh, strengthen the foundation. That work is going to continue for about another two weeks. Uh, 
So that's basically the end of the presentation. Uh, just wanted to say again that this, uh, these slides will be on the uh, HOA website. Um, and our committee is going to be writing a more detailed summary uh, of the uh, resurfacing project uh, this summer. So I am happy to take questions about the resurfacing project. Let's, let's go with resurfacing first, and I'm sure that some of you might have some questions about the other work that's being done on the Tennessee River Bridge and the uh, intersection at uh, Highway 11 and uh, the, the widening up through the... Uh, uh, up through Lenore City. So, resurfacing questions. Anybody? Yes? Yes, uh, we talked about that several times with, uh, with TDOT. And um, the main reason why we, we chose not to go with the rumble strips is when you, when you put the rumble strips in the highway, you're actually digging a little, a little hole. That weakens the, uh, the asphalt at the joint between the asphalt on the two different sides. Um, TDOT advised us that uh, where they put these uh, rumble strips, uh, within a matter of a few years, potholes develop on those center lines. Uh, the reason we're putting the reflectors in is to, of course, avoid that problem, but the reflectors are going to be spaced, uh, I think it's 80 feet apart on the straightaway and 40 feet on curved sections. So if you migrate off your lane, you're going to hit those reflectors um, and you're going, to, you're going to hear a noise so that hopefully that, uh, you'll recognize that you're creeping over into the other lane. Any other resurfacing questions? Wow. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Well, I, I agree with that, and we talked to TDOT about that. Um, it, at those intersections where there is no left turn lane, okay, if you're making a right turn lane, they're, they're going to do what they can to broaden those turns without actually making a separate turn lane. Um, in the locations where there are left turn lanes, uh, there just is simply not enough room to make the, uh, the right turn lanes because if you've noticed, what they do is they don't actually widen the entire road. They take up shoulder to create that center left turn lane. Okay, so where there's no left turn lanes, they're going to do their best to uh, uh, broaden those uh, turns. Now, there are going to be, I think, uh, three intersections where they actually do have some space to create uh, a right turn lane. And one of them is at Poplar Ridge. Another one is at Cayuga Drive. And then I think there's another one down at uh, northbound Chattooga uh, where they're actually going to be uh, putting in a uh, little extra space. I'm speaking specifically about the other side, Chattooga Cove Drive. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. We're going to shorten two of them, yes.
Are, are you talking it like in front of the Tennessee Golf Club? That's yeah. That's Cayuga and um, I forget the other uh, Wakita. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the reason they don't have it is because you do have a left turn lane going into Wakita, and so that narrows that space down. Um, t uh, be before we had this uh, elimination and shortening, I think we had like seven passing zones on the entire 11 mile stretch. Um, and uh, for that, that segment, um, you know, you've got that left turn lane going into Wakita, plus you have that center <coughs> buffer lane uh, that goes right in front of the uh, Tenassi Clubhouse. A yeah, little north of that. Yeah. 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 Um, but you do expect that to be good at 30 miles an hour in the gym. You can drive for 11 miles at 30 miles an hour. It's yeah. A lot, of places, a, lot, a lot more traffic. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> well, I know it's frustrating because I've, you know, I, I, get the, I get behind some of those drivers as well. <clears throat> I just wanted to mention. Yep, thank, thank you. Okay, well, let's open it up to any other questions that you have about uh, uh, road work that's being done. Have you considered putting a light in at the 321, the 444 intersections? A, a light? Are you I talking about a traffic control? No, lights, just lights. Oh, lights. <laughs> um, well, I had a hard time hearing you, but are you talking about lights on the new Tennessee River Bridge? No. No. You're talking I'm talking about, about lights at the, at the intersections of 321 to 444. Oh, yes. Okay. We've been talking about that for about two years. And uh, what we've been trying to do is uh, uh, get the attention of the uh, Loudoun County Commission uh, because that's not a – Tennessee uh, Department of Transportation does not do street lights. Um, that is something that has to be funded by some other organization um, and in coordination then with the, uh, uh, I think it's Fort Loudoun Utilities. And um, so we've, that is one of the things that we're working on because I agree with you, that intersection is really difficult at night. It's hard enough during the day. So are you talking at the bottom of the uh, exit ramp coming from Lenore City getting on to 444? Oh, the other way, getting on to 321. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> there, there's very limited space there, as you can, as you can tell. Um, the best thing that we can do is you get yourself lined up um, with the highway. You'll be able to see cars coming in, the, in your mirror rather than trying to, you know, look over your shoulder. I think that's difficult. Yeah. Well, you actually are going to have a little bit more space now with the, with the redesign better than it was, uh, but I agree with you. That, uh, that was difficult uh, the way it used to be. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Th th they're going to enhance that with signage and, and uh, some reflectors. Um, but as far as the, uh, the actual street light itself, that, we're working that separately. Well, they're not going to be done until we get the resurfacing done. Yeah, 
Yeah, 321 and 444, right? Yeah. He was going to, he was going to do a follow up on that because. Maybe this will be the we last have more question. questions. Yes, sir. I've intended to ask this many, many meetings in the past, and it's, I think, appropriate because we have potential state representatives here today, and it would involve them, I guess, as well. But we've been property owners here for 26 years in Teleco Village, and from the very first time, it has always bugged me when I get off of I-75, especially in Lenore City, and start to come to Teleco Village, that I got to turn south. <laughs> on 321 North, and this is one of the only places I've ever seen this in the state of Tennessee or anywhere else where the, you, the sign doesn't indicate what direction the highway is going. Sign is placed. If the sign, if the sign, if the road is going south, then well, it should say south. When it goes north, then you make it north. Well, we've we've had that <laughs> we've had that discussion with T. Dot, and uh, they they really had no they they, they had nothing to uh, offer as a solution. We'll take one more question. Do we have just one more? One more question. Anyone? All right. Well, thank you very much. All right, everyone, again, I thank, I thank all of the candidates for coming and spending their time with us today. And Dennis and Joe, thank you for keeping us updated on all the new things going on in Teleco Village. So with that, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Second? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you. We'll see you back here on the 28th of Ju uh, July. No, June, June, June. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you.